Good evening, everyone. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all back to another of the Military Aviation Museum's webinars. I'm Keegan Chetwin, Director of the Military Aviation Museum. We would love to have your support for these webinars. It's uh, donations from folks like you who are listening, participating. Um, that's really how we're keeping these free and keeping them out there and available for people. Uh, you may have also noticed the archive has started to be uh, populated on our website. So if you missed one of these, feel free to visit the Military Aviation Museum website. Uh, under the Explore tab, you will find the webinar archive and also a way to sign up to be first to know about subsequent webinars. So tonight's format's gonna be a little bit different. Uh, it's gonna be more conversational than we have done these in the past. And that's because our guest tonight is an old friend of mine, Kermit Weeks. Kermit, how are you doing? Hey, Keegan, thanks for inviting me. So what we're gonna do this evening is Kermit's gonna take us through um, his his very special collection of aircraft, not totally dissimilar to ours, but Kermit, you have some that uh, we don't have and frankly just really wouldn't be able to operate here, uh, one of which is a Sunderland flying boat. But before we get into that, Kermit, would you maybe talk to us a little bit about your vision that is fantasy of flight? Oh my gosh. Well, man, I don't know how far back you want to go, but I started in Miami uh, with what I call Act One, which was the Weeks Air Museum. We opened in 1985. And uh, it soon became apparent that I needed a bigger place. Uh, being on an airport wasn't that uh, uh, productive to get a lot of traffic, and I was in a lease situation. So I came to Central Florida uh, to start Fantasy of Flight to kind of control my own destiny. Um, built uh, uh, two runways. I've got lake access to fly vintage seaplanes. And uh, you know, we opened in 1995. Uh, we closed uh, what I call Act Two in 2014, uh, you know, like six years ago, and I'm working on what I call Act Three. Um, I realized it's tough in the museum quote unquote business that, uh, you know, without grant subsidies, donations, volunteers to really make it pay for itself. And I really kind of was disillusioned with that whole concept and product. I'm in the Central Florida tourism area. I'm competing with a lot of uh, big distractions. And over time, I came to learn why I was led here and what I was supposed to create. So what I'm telling everybody is uh, Act 3 is about to begin. Please go take a bathroom uh, break and get a Coke and a hot dog because uh, hang loose. We're going to get started one of these days on Act 3. So that's what I'm working on right now. Kermit, you, uh, you believe that there's a kind of an interesting way that these airplanes affect people who visit museums, visit attractions, and and experience them flying. Can you talk to us a little bit about how flying and inspiration interconnect? Well, it's interesting. Um, fantasy of flight in the long run really has nothing to do with airplanes. Um, what I realize, I've always had a fascination with both physical flight, and there's plenty about me on the internet about you know flying competition aerobatics and all that kind of stuff, collecting a lot of airplanes and flying and restoring airplanes. But I've also had a fascination with what I would call inner flight. Uh, I won't get too much into my woo-woo side, but uh, basically uh, I've had the opportunity to have experiences beyond this five sense reality. And what happened was when I finally moved to Central Florida and I realized within two years, the people weren't coming that I was told were gonna come, I became a little bit disillusioned, and over time, really about a 10 to 15 year period, I began to understand what I was here to create. And it's really not about airplanes, history, and how an airplane flies. It's about the metaphor of what flight symbolizes to everyone. Because there's a limited number, forgive me for a lot of people listening out there, of anal aviation enthusiasts, but there's a very big world out there you could touch if you delivered a concept in a very different way than is being delivered. I am so over and done with the museum business, uh, but basically what I realized was what Fantasy of Flight about was, was basically taking my fascination with outer flight combining it with inner flight because they never had anything to do with each other. And I began to realize it was really what I'm trying to create. It's about flight of the human spirit. So it uses flight as a metaphor because you, I defy you to come up with a more profound metaphor for pushing our boundaries, reaching beyond ourselves and freedom than flight. You cannot because in the physical, everyone can relate to reaching for the sky, reaching for the stars. 
That has nothing to do with airplanes. And within us, we each soar in our imagination and we fly in our dreams. That has nothing to do with airplanes. So where Fantasy Flight's going with Act 3 is, we're going to still have airplanes. We're still going to deliver uh, you know, a little history there, but in a completely different way. What we're going to do is we're going to use timeless stories of the human experience, not about aviation, timeless stories of the human experience that will garner from aviation stories that are inspiring. And, you know, theoretically, you potentially see an experience of somebody like a Lindbergh or a Glenn Curtis or a Jimmy Doolittle or somebody like that, you see something that they experienced that's common to your life. And the way we deliver it, you cannot not reflect on where you've come from, where you currently are, and where you dream to go. And so it's really more about, in, and as a parallel uh, to the existing industry around me, it's not a parallel because I'm going to be a complete opposite. And basically, the, the the industry around me, you know, the big boys and all the little attractions, they basically use entertainment as an end product. And what I hope to do is use entertainment as a means to an end. It's still going to be fun. Still going to have characters. I'm developing my own characters. Still going to have great theming, great ride technology, immersive environments like the big boys. But instead of entertainment being an end product, it becomes a means to an end for your own self-discovery and self-transformation. You're gonna walk in my park one person, I'm not gonna tell you anything. You're gonna change yourself inside, leave a different person, nobody is gonna know what went on inside. And if I can deliver that, I think I'm on to something. Kermit, I think we're all eager to come visit a facility such as you described. Um, you have kind of a, an interesting collection with many, many rare and unusual airplanes in it, uh, not least of which is the Sunderland, but you've also got other flying boats represented in your collection. Uh, you want to talk to us a little bit about uh, some of your Sikorskis? Yeah, um, I mean, I've got the, the first one I ever collected was a Grumman Duck, and uh, I'm actually the biggest owner since the U.S. Navy of World War II. I've had four. I'm down to two. Uh, but the two Sikorskis on the screen there were uh, flown by Martin and Osa Johnson. Uh, they had some factory pilots initially, but they took they shipped them down to Cape Town. They were like the original uh, adventure photographers, chronology. They did films. They would come back from their expeditions and show them, you know, where these were still unexplored lands and worlds, and people were fascinated by it. And uh, they're the only two current flying Sikorskis are painted in the colors of the S-38 on the left and the S-39 on the right, and I happen to own both of them. <laughs> Certainly an interesting story. Kermit, you have a special connection to your Sikorsky S-43. Uh, I've just put a picture up on the screen there for everyone. Can you tell us a little bit about what your connection to this specific airframe is? Well, it's interesting. Without going too far off the chart on my woo-woo side, um, let's just say I have a connection with Howard Hughes, and he basically, uh, you know, he actually helped me get this airplane, and um, it was a fascinating story. This is the one I acquired if the engines were on the ground. This was the day, I think, that I basically, you know, had cut the deal and went there to look at it, and we decided there was some hull corrosion and things like that. It was uh, south of Houston in a hangar, and basically, you know, instead of flying at home and risking it because I hadn't flown in seven years and ripping it apart. I, I'm so packed with airplanes right now in my limited space. I thought, you know, let's just take it apart there, restore the airplane to honor Howard in the way that the airplane was the last time Howard flew it, which is not this paint job, by the way. And uh, so, you know, so it's in storage right now. And when, uh, uh, you know, fantasy of flight really kind of gets going and some certain things happen and this coronavirus thing kind of dies down. You know, that's going to be one of my priorities to get that airplane flying. It's, I mean, what, there's only three on the planet and the other two are actually JRSs, which were, uh, you know, the military version. And this particular one, Howard, of course, Howard had to do everything special. He originally bought this in 1939 to fly around the world. And which he eventually did in the Lockheed 14. This is the only Sikorsky that has completely flush rivets on it. So pretty cool. This ship photo, by the way, was shot by Phil McKenna. It's a great photo. Um, Kermit, 
owning and operating your own flying boats, and especially true flying boats that aren't amphibians, is really rare these days. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about some of the complexities of owning a true flying boat? Your, uh, your, your Sunderland, it doesn't have wheels that retract up and stow. It really does need to land and operate from water. Yeah, absolutely. And what you're seeing there in the picture where the wheels are, that's what they call beaching gear. And in the form that it's in right there, uh, we took off, there's some flotation that fits on the outside of the deal because that obviously that won't float. The wheels will actually float because they have air in them, but we have to add some flotation to the, the vertical part there uh, so it'll float in the water because obviously we take it down to the lake, we put it in the water with the beach and you taxi it in, and then you go out there and there's a little uh, block and tackle and you you basically lower this thing, it disconnects with three pins and then you float them back into the shore and, you know, take them back with a tractor or a forklift or something, you know, but then once it's in the water, it is a pure flying boat. So... <laughs> We often talk about how we keep airplanes airworthy. Um, how do you keep one seaworthy as well, Kermit? Well, if it leaks, you got to fix it. <laughs> you know, um, we did we did some hull work on it. Of course, when I purchased the airplane, it was in southern England, uh, basically at a place called Calshot at the head of the uh, Solent River there, and uh, kind of by the Isle of Wight. And uh, we did, uh, you know, we had some work done on it on the hull and uh you know check for leaks and blah 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 and of course you know the airplane on the inside we've got uh float switches we got to have batteries you got to realize when this thing sits in the water during the war somebody lived on those things 24 7. that doesn't happen here and when i landed this thing and you know we had it in different places uh my seaplane ramp wasn't done i left it at oshkosh for a year we flew it over to oshkosh and made the show uh 1994 and uh, left it there a year. We pulled it out on the land, came back the next year, put it in the water. And by that time, I needed to bring it home, but I still hadn't gotten my seaplane ramp permit and had it built yet. So when I landed it here in Florida, it sat in the water for a year. Well, let me tell you, owning a flying boat that sits out in the water is like leaving a baby in a forest of wild animals. You got people trying to break in. You got you got hurricane problems. You got is it going to leak? Are the batteries still charged? Do the float switches all work? I mean, having a flying boat sitting in the water for any length of time is not you know <laughs> is not uh, is is not a comfortable situation. Prior to you, though, it really did operate pretty much consistently out of water. You're the uh, owner who's kept it indoors and out of the water longest of any of them, are you not? Well, I am. Well, when Edward Halton owned the airplane, which was before me, uh, if if well, the airplane came over. It was flown in, you know, Australia, then New Zealand. Eventually, came over. Charlie Charlie Blair had it in the Caribbean for a little while. But if it's being operated all the time, being in the water is one thing. But if you but if you're not going to operate it all the time. Uh, eventually, you know, like in the wintertime when Edward Halton had it in England, he'd pull it out of the water and, and stick it in storage. So any of the shots you see in the water was when they were, you know, operating it on a regular basis. Okay. You have a lake on the property specifically to operate flying boats. And did that lake, you purchased the property because it had the lake or at least partially because the lake was there, correct? Yeah, partially. It was interesting. When I, when I was, Actually, I saw this property before the Weeks Air Museum ever opened in 1985. I continued to look in Central Florida, eventually buying not just this, it was three pieces I had to put together. And there was, I, I just had this sense, this feeling, there was three things that I needed to look for. One was great tourist access. I'm on an interstate halfway between Tampa and Orlando. I'm 25 minutes down the road from Walt Disney World. Okay. The next thing was, so I had good tourist access. I needed at least enough land for a 5,000 foot runway to fly in P-51s and bombers and stuff like that, which I, which I just have. And, and the third thing was key to, to, to the Sunderland and some of my other flying is I wanted lake access to be able to fly vintage airplanes in their natural environment. And I can't think of a museum anywhere that has seaplanes in their natural environment. I, I don't, you know, they're inside, they don't fly. And so part of my future dream for Fantasy of Flight, it won't be part of Act Three, but it'll be part of Act Three, Part Two, 
we're going to build a recreation of like a Pan Am plumper base and all my flying boats are going to be bent down on a lake in a Art Deco themed, really cool period environment uh, place. Well, that I think there's some of us who really, really want to see. Um, Kermit, this is an image of your Sunderland being put in the water. Can you talk to us a little bit about how the beaching gear actually works and how you maneuver this large and somewhat cumbersome airplane down into the water and get it prepared for flight? Right. Well, as you can see, there's a tractor in the back there, okay? And there's basically, there's a hook on the front which is the mooring hook where you hook to the buoy when it's in the water. And what we would have done here is we would have used the tractor, which is our mowing tractor. We would have towed it from the hangar you saw it in before. And we basically would have towed it down the runway, nose first, down to uh, not the position it's in, but up to about where that little yellow uh, bulldozer is, okay? Then there's, a, there's basically a hook in the back, which is like a glider release hook, okay? And uh, and what we would have done is the beaching gear, once it's on, all it does is roll. There's three pins that roll. And so what happens is we basically, um, it, the airplane prior to this would have been sitting up where the yellow bulldozer was, okay? And what we would have done is we would have hooked that bulldozer up to the back end with a strap. You can see the strap at the back there. And as you can see, I've since started the outboard engines, number one and four. OK, so what happens is, is I'm in the cockpit, the flight engineer is looking out the top to make sure everything's OK. And so what I'm doing at some point, I'm going to slowly start adding the throttles or the or the we've got chocks in it. So the bull, we're going to pull the chocks. I'm going to start moving the airplane slowly down the ramp while the bulldozer in the back is going to kind of hold me back. Once I start rolling, I just go back to idle. And what will happen is right about this point. When the wheels hit the water line, somebody tells me because I can't see, okay, I'm looking ahead. And as soon as it hits the water line, um, uh, somebody waves to the guy in the bulldozer. He uh, goes forward quickly to slacken the line. And I effectively have like a glider release on the hook in the cockpit where I release that strap in the back. So basically now I control the airplane and I'm basically taxing it around, steering it with the outboard engines. There's no brakes, there's no rudder, and uh, you know, uh, of course it goes a little bit slower with the beaching gear on, but I'm not seeing where the, where the flotation is on the beaching gear, but there would have been some flotation there somewhere, or, or maybe we added it once we got, I think that's what we did, we added it when we got out there, and we strapped a bunch of five gallon cans on there, that, that's why it's not on there now. Okay. You've been quoted as saying the Sunderland is perhaps the largest uh, four-engine flying boat that it's practical to own. Um, I think you know what's coming next, Kermit. Talk to yeah. us about the Hawaii Mars. Oh, my God. Well, let me tell you, man. Everybody says, oh, Kermit, go get the, the Hawaii Mars, blah, blah, blah. Well, let me tell you, when I designed my biggest hangar, which is 200 feet wide, and I had to, the top of the, I designed at the top of my hangar doors, uh, were designed for the top of the propellers for the Sunderland. So my hangar doors are 25, 24 feet high, and there's actually a cutout in the middle of the hangar that has a roll-up door so I can get the tail in the hangar, okay? Well, it fits in there, and I can put a DC-3 and a bunch of other airplanes in there and stuff. The Martin Mars is, like, stupid. The only way that airplane can operate is either being by paid the, by the U.S. Navy or the Canadian Forestry Service, which is what's paying for this one, okay? And, I mean, it's got uh, 3350s on it. I, to build, if they gave me the airplane, it would cost me $4 million to build a hangar for it. The Sunderland is a, what I say is the only practical four-engine flying boat. It has a 112-foot wingspan, okay? The Mars is 200 feet. It's almost twice as big as the Sunderland in the wingspan. The, the, the span of the horizontal stabilizer is like 60 feet. I mean, the span is always like 15 feet less than a PBY wingspan. And the top of the vertical fin of the Martin Mars on the beaching gear would stick out the peak of the roof of my hangar 15 feet. So, I mean, it's just... 
I, I, man, I, I hope one can end up somewhere. You know, the U.S. Navy needs to get one, but they don't have the money to build a hangar. And it sure doesn't make sense to have a Martin Mars sitting outside the Pensacola Museum in Florida here, U.S. Navy Museum, with a hurricane coming through, because it would end up in their front porch. So you actually got to fly this one. You you took it to Oshkosh, if I remember correctly. What was it like to to manhandle an airplane of this size around? Oh my God. Well, I mean, I I, I hope most of your uh, your followers here, you know, know that I have a YouTube channel. I got a lot of YouTube videos. Just go to Kermit Weeks YouTube. Uh, there's one of uh, the uh, flying at the, uh, you know, the uh, Oshkosh, and uh, there's some, you know, crawling through it, giving some, you know, tours of what's happening and stuff. And it was interesting. Wayne Colson, who owns, uh, you know, Colson uh, Flying Service, uh, that that had run this for the, you know, the Forestry Service fighting fires, uh, he basically was asked by the EAA to bring it there. And you know, what I had always mentioned to somebody that, you know, hey, if you ever take it to Oshkosh, I'll pay for the fuel. And so uh, basically by paying for the fuel, which was uh, $40,000 Canadian, uh, I basically got to go up there. I got to kind of get checked out in the airplane, uh, do some flights, some training, and then be in the right seat flying it to Oshkosh. And I did the takeoff and the landing, takeoff out of Canada and the landing at Oshkosh. And and after it landed at Oshkosh, I was I was done with it. And then they, they played with it during the show and, and had a great time displaying it. I think everybody really enjoyed it. Yeah, I remember seeing it there and uh, was just completely awestruck by its size. I, I don't think it's easy to describe what it's like to see it sitting out there on a lake. Um, Kermit, other than its practicality of operations, kind of what, what was in what was going through your mind when you were seeking a Sunderland? Did you kind of fall into this or were you actually out there yeah. looking for one? No, I wasn't looking for it, but it's kind of interesting. It's like, um, you know, when I early started collecting, it's kind of like, you know, what would pop up on the radar, what was available. And, you know, owning a Sunderland to most people is hanging an albatross around your neck. I don't mean a Grumman albatross. I mean, like the metaphor albatross. And and basically, it's like, you know, unless look at most museums, what do you do if you can get it inside? That's the end of its life. OK, uh, the sister ship to this is a Sangringham and it's in the museum in Southampton. It'll never fly again. Uh, at least I've got the opportunity to, you know, go out and fly it some more because of, you know, my uh, forethought of having her on a lake and my fascination with you know, trying to keep things like this going at some point. Um, of course, I've had my fun with it, you know, for a while, and I've focused on other things, but the potential is there to get it flying again. Kermit, can you talk to us a little bit about the history of your airplane and where it was built? Well, uh, it was built at the factory in Belfast, I think, and uh, that looks like probably somewhere there. It's in, uh, you know, Ireland. And uh, basically, it flew th with, uh, started with the Brit, flew in World War II. It was a patrol bomber. And the Sunderlands were, you know, military airport planes for, you know, taking supplies. Uh, they had depth charge capabilities. Uh, you know, they'd look for submarines and things like that and uh, rescue pilots and stuff. So it was a kind of pretty much a utility airplane. And uh, uh, my airplane started off flying for the British. And then I believe it flew for, well, it flew for the Canadians and I think also the Norwegians. I may be wrong on the Canadians, but I knew it flew for the, the Norwegians. But it flew for with three different countries during the war. And then at the end of the war, it was uh, uh, purchased by uh, the New Zealand Air Force, believe it or not. And it flew out of, uh, I think, on the west side of the Big Bay in Auckland, New Zealand. And they used to take it to the Fijian Islands and things like that, you know, and they flew it around there. So we've got a couple pictures here um, that will kind okay. of show people the, the factory there in Belfast. Um, we've got a big thank you to all the old Belfast Facebook group uh, who supplied images of the factory where the airplane was built. Um, it's not actually in any of these images, but this is after a raid on that factory by the Luftwaffe. Um, it's kind of interesting because we in the United States don't generally associate photos of aircraft production with battle damage and you know blown up factories but uh, that's very much something they were contending with uh, in the early days of the war over there in the UK uh, that's a short sterling in the factory uh, another kind of an interesting thing 
uh, was that the Shorts factory was co-owned by Harland and Wolf, the people who built the Titanic. Uh, Kermit, is there evidence of a shipbuilding tradition that, that is clear in the Sunderland? Oh, wow. It's the only four-engine flying boat I've ever owned, so I, I, I couldn't tell you. Um, I, I can tell you that, you know, once you learn how to land it, it's got a little bit of a shark fin on the bottom. And, oh, my God, if you just bring that in so slow and bring it down, you cannot even tell when you touch the water. There were times I would land, and I didn't even know I was in the water, you know, until you started, you know, really slowing down. But I, I got to tell you, you know, the, the shots there, that factory there, looks like the, uh, the Germans really uh, uh, messed up uh, uh, the shorts there in the Belfast, I'm just saying. <laughs> Certainly. Um, we've got a couple interesting images of Sunderlands during the war. Uh, you mentioned they were used for anti-submarine patrols and, and uh, you know, a couple of other interesting things, ferrying cargo and, and, and such like. Kind of an interesting thing. Um, it picked up the name Flying Porcupine, and this is something that uh, people have actually researched a lot. Uh, is the British press said the Germans nicknamed it the Flying Porcupine because they were so impressed by its many gun fixtures. Um, that kind of interestingly is a, an anachronistic thing. The Germans never did call it the Flying Porcupine. The uh, 303 caliber machine guns uh, on a Sunderland were not particularly ferocious based on the German assessment of the airplane. Um, it was also thought at one time that radar masts that were equipped to the airplanes might be part of the Flying Porcupine nickname, but it turns out to basically have just been a fabrication by the British press. Um, the reason I wanted to share this picture with everyone tonight is uh, it was very, very common during the war to actually edit out the radar masts over the tail. And this is a rare photo that actually does show those radar masts on the airplane. Um, this is kind of an interesting one, Kermit. Um, you operating the flying boat you know when you were landing in lakes and things like that you kind of have to have a boat or a motor launch or something to get out to the airplane so loading even simple cargoes can be kind of challenging can you talk to us a little bit about you know how you were able to transport a boat with you to service the airplane well it was interesting um basically the door where the guys are going there on the left below the pilot seat that's the main door if they're trying to put something in the little side uh, door there under the uh, you know, the number two engine, uh, there's a little bit of a galley hatch that we have, I assume would have been there on the military version because mine was converted later. But uh, basically, we actually had, believe it or not, when we came over, we had a crew of six and we had three Americans, uh, myself, uh, somebody that was a mechanic of my uh, AI at the time, uh, inspector airframe guy that signed off the airplanes. And uh, I had another guy that was kind of my my flight engineer. He was a mechanic as well, but he was learning to be the flight engineer. And then the British crew comprised of the the, the guy that had been flying the airplane as the captain, uh, the mechanic that had been uh, operating it, and the British flight engineer that had been the British flight engineer. So we were kind of learning and sharing information. And, you know, it was kind of interesting. The British kind of operated one way and the Americans kind of came in and we were like, well, I don't know, we're going to try it. We're going to do it this way. We actually had about a probably a seven foot blow up boat with like a, a small horsepower on the back there. And we got to where we would land somewhere and the boat, we, we would put it inside that front door. And we basically, you know, we'd land and, uh, you know, and you got to remember every place that I landed, I had to go before the trip and figure out every, it was going to be a different country. I had to figure out where I was going to land, what was the water depth. What could I moor to? How am I going to clear customs and get them to where I'm landing in the water? And where am I going to get airplane gas? Okay. I literally, before I went over to England, I had to stop at all these potential places and talk to people and arrange for things. But I mean, I felt like Charles Lindbergh, you know, kind of doing the, the Northwest uh, passage ramp, you know, through to Asia, you know, going through Alaska and stuff. So I literally had to redo all that. And so anyway, we would land somewhere. And my flight engineer that worked for me at the time, you know, he also was my my bowsman because you have to have somebody that you see where the turret in this picture is kind of pushed to the back. Well, they do the guy up there front. He has got to pick up and take off the, uh, you know, the rope from the, the mooring buoy. So anyway, we had this blow up raft and I would land the airplane. 
we'd let the engines cool down a little bit. I would shut down the inboards because I'm steering the airplane with the one and four, the outboard engines, because remember, there's no rudder. Okay, you can only steer it with the engines while the engines are running. And then uh, he would basically shove the, the, the raft out, the, the thing, while we're moving, he would pump it up the rest of the day were there, stick the motor on it, start it, and take off and go talk to the guys on shore. And, and you know, before we ever, you know, so we always had somebody that was, uh, you know, uh, you know, we had a boat on board that we could use. We were very fortunate um, when it was in England, any time that they would uh, fuel it, they would have like a boat or a, a raft or kind of like over here, what we use as a pontoon boat. And they would take 55 gallon drums, they'd fill them up at the shore, take the boat out there uh, with the flying boat at the mooring buoy, and they would hand pump or take a battery with them or something. And they would you know, have to service the airplane out on the water. Well, we thought, well, damn, that seems like a lot of work. So when we first landed in Ireland, I, it was calm and all that stuff. We grabbed our little boat. We just towed the damn thing right, right up to the freaking dock. There wasn't a lot of wind, so it wasn't a problem. We could control the, you know, push the boat away and stuff. And uh, we, we just had a fuel truck come out from the airport, and we just filled it up like we were in an airport. And we did that at every stop, uh, except when we finally got to Oshkosh. You know, we had to do it with 55-gallon uh, drums. But every place we stopped, we just pulled the airplane up to the dock and a fuel truck pulled up and we filled up the up the tanks. <laughs> and the British guys were looking at us like, where did these guys come from? <laughs> well, anything to make life a little bit easier.